Hello, everybody, and welcome back to part five of our series about making fire tools. Man, we've gotten some good stuff here. We've got some birdcage pokers, we got some birdcage shovelers, and we got some uh, birdcage broomses, and uh, all pretty awesome tools. But one thing that is often neglected uh, when making fire tools, especially by the beginner, is a proper way to hold them and display them. Now, there are as many variations of fireplace tool holders or as there are stars in the sky. There's a lot of them. So for this particular video, I've decided to do one of the simplest versions because most of your modern fireplaces are normally going to be stone or brick, and there is something to be said for a holder that is mounted to that stone or brick. There's a lot of people that make the three-legged stands. I'm, I'm not a fan of the three-legged stands. They just they are easily knocked over. They're not very stable. I think the only stands that I've really been a fan of are stands when you have like a one-inch thick base plate. It's basically like setting, you know, a giant anvil on there. That's stable. I can't tell you how many times I've knocked over a fireplace tool set uh, that's on a stand. So I don't care for them. I usually prefer having them solidly attached to something. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be using a style that my mentor had originally made. And what I'll do is I'll actually uh, throw a picture up. We're going to be using inch and a half by quarter inch stock, an 18 inch piece. And I've got this thing lined up. And by the power of magical technology, here's the picture. Blah, blam. Uh, with all the demarcations. So if you will pause your video, you can actually pull the measurements off that and slice it up accordingly. But what we're going to do in a nutshell is we're going to start by coming in with our chisel, slitting these ends, drawing them out, making some little interesting curves on them, and then coming in, texturing this bar, punching it, and then we'll make some hooks for it. For the three hooks, we're going to use 3 quarter inch by 3 sixteenths flat bar cut into 6 inch lengths, and you're going to need three of them. This particular project is going to require a lot more hammering than our other ones. You're going to need to texture and shape quite a bit. So, you know, eat your Wheaties, uh, take you some aspirin, and get ready to go to work. So the first thing we're going to start with is going to be that backer bar right here. And so I will come in. Now, if you mark this guy off, and again, these marks are just, you know, for figuring purposes starting with, uh, you do need to come in with a chisel and mark the line that you're going to split because we're going to heat that up and we're going to take our chisel while it's hot and cut it back. But it's always handy to mark it before you start putting it in the fire or you're going to lose your mark. So let's heat this up and we'll go to the top of the anvil. When you start doing this type of work, you're going to come to find out very, very quickly why it was so handy to have an apprentice. Now, if you're by yourself, uh, you can use a regular hand chisel to do this with, but if you have a buddy to hold the steel, it's going to help you a lot. Uh, a hold fast on the anvil is going to be helpful as well, uh, but this is something that if you do by yourself and you don't have any of the above, you're going to kind of have to be careful and patient. Now, notice I just didn't uh, kind of hog it there and just try to murder it. Uh, be patient. It may take you a couple heats to cut all the way through, uh, but that's okay. So I'm going to take one more heat and we're going to try this again. All right, here we go again. Now, one thing to take note of is that I am not planning to cut all the way through this on top of the anvil. That is because the top of the anvil is hardened, and I don't want to put a cut in the top of my anvil, nor do I want to dull out my cutting tool here. So what's going to end up happening is I will move over here to the table of the anvil because this piece is left unhardened for a reason. That's so that you can cut all the way through, not damage your tool, and not gink up the hammering surface there. I take a good heat, and now we're really going to come in here and see about cutting all the way through. And it shouldn't be terribly difficult. Uh, you can see a couple of good strikes right there, and we are now slit and good to go. I'm just going to put one more right in that corner. Make sure we open that really well. And there we go. All right, boys and girls, pay attention. Uh, this is a trade secret technique. We need to draw these out into a taper, but either one of these would be in the way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bend this one out of the way so I can go to work on this one. 
Now this is one of those pieces that's going to move over the surface of the anvil quite a bit. You're going to use several different faces and several different positions to get a good job here. But you can see that piece being pulled out. We're ready for another heat. Now you don't have to go crazy with this taper. I'll make sure that I've got a good even one. Make sure everything is nicely squared up. And I'm good to go with that right there. Now, another trade secret. What we're gonna do is you see how long that taper is? That's the first one I've done, and I really want all the ones that come after this to match it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my soapstone, I'm going to put this to the edge, and I'm going to measure the length of that taper. Get in there. So that all the other tapers are going to match it. If you don't do this, you're going to have a, a, a surprising amount of variation in your piece, and it's not going to look right. This is one of the ways that you keep some evenness uh, in your work. Now, as you saw before, we just moved this piece out of the way to get to this one. Well, guess what? Now what we'll do is we'll take another heat, we'll bend this one back into place, and bend this one out of the way. Man, ain't blacksmithing awesome? Very quickly, move that boy out of the way. Bring that back into shape. And here we go. Now when you're doing a taper, make sure and establish the point first before you really want to start stretching. Uh, it's a very common beginner mistake uh, to kind of start working this backside first and you end up with a taper that's way too long. So bring it down to the point first and then if it's not long enough continue to work it out. But since I've got a nice measurement here on the top of the anvil, I can see that that is in fact the correct length. And they're not always going to be identical in thickness because if you're cut slightly off, you're going to have more material in one side than the other one. So you can't rely on how beefy it looks uh, to judge its length. So now we got that going on. Here we are back to there. I'm going to double check that. You know what, I'm going to take a look. I'm going to bring it out just a little bit more. Just a tad wee bit more, just to make me happy, and I'm good there. Now I'm going to come back and take one more full heat, and now I'm going to bend this over the edge of the, oh, excuse me, the horn of the anvil, and give us a nice curve. We've got a good heat coming over the end. There's one bend. And of course, try to use the same part of the anvil that you do uh, for one as you do for the other one. Again, this will help keep it even. And again, we don't have to have perfection here, but you can see she's looking pretty darn good. Now one thing I will do is we've still got these really square edges. So I'm going to come in, and you can use a lighter hammer for this as well. And I am going to break those edges. Again, I cannot stress enough um, that a sign of good work, all the edges are broken. That's what's going to really make it look like hand done work. So break those edges. Now that we've done that, uh, I'm going to flip this bad boy around and go ahead and mark it up and do the same thing to the opposite side. And then we'll worry about dressing this and getting it, uh, getting our holes in it. Back to the top of the anvil, I'm going to make my first cuts here. And notice that first line that I do is really just to kind of groove everything to give me a 
nice stable place to work with from there. And I'm going to go almost all the way through it. And I'll take another heat, then I'll go to the table of the anvil and cut all the way through. And there's our full cut, and we'll get to hammering. After I do the coolest thing ever and just bend that metal out of my way so I can go to work. Good solid heat. You can see me making that point first. And then I'm going to come back to the rest of it. And even it out. Judge that against my mark. It looks like I'm pretty good to go there. Now, in this particular instance, I am not going to wait to work it over the horn. That looks pretty good. Bend that out of the way. Bend this one back. And I'm ready to go to work. Now I'm ready to go to work. Another good heat. Again, notice that I'm working just the tip to start with. Make sure that my taper is even. Looks like my measurement's pretty good. Now, I'm a little cold right here, so instead of fighting it, I'm just gonna take another heat, put everything back together, and then we'll bend everything into place. Yeah, a little cold, just gonna heat it. Now, one thing I've ever rarely been guilty of is say, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Um, notice that when it looks a little cold, I go back to the fire. You're going to save yourself a lot of problems is if it's a little cold or if it's a little off just go back and put it in the fire heat it back up you've got plenty of heat in there don't try to fight the metal if it's getting a little too cold stop pause put it back in the fire all right move everything back into place over the horn of the anvil Bring that down. And this is where you kind of need to be able to judge both sides if they're going to match. But that's looking pretty darn good. So I'm going to flatten this out. Come in and break those edges. And looking pretty good now what I'll do is I'll come back in take another heat in this area right here and I'm going to work this material all the way down one of the biggest mistakes that I see novices make is that they do not beat up the work enough uh, if this were a piece from a beginner what would most likely happen is they would work that edge and never touch this factory finish it's going to look not great. So what I'll do now is I'll put this portion in the fire. I will break the edges. And I'll actually go as far as to kind of break up that flat surface as well. I want this thing to look like it was pulled out of a block of metal. And that's what gives it that good look. Now I hear the savvy and the skeptical out there among you saying, Trent, 
Surely, if they didn't have to do all that work just to make it look good, they wouldn't. And you are correct. But at the same time, there's no example of a lot of these pieces that don't have that the, the entire surface has been worked. And that's because of the size stock that they were starting with. So here's the deal. Uh, back in the day when uh, iron and steel came from the iron mongers, which were the people that manufactured the iron, it came in pretty much three sizes, small, medium, and oh my God. So you didn't really have a, a nice stock like we do that doesn't require very much work to get it where we want it. So that's the reason, because they were always reducing from giant pieces of metal into smaller pieces, which meant that everything on there was hammered because it had to be. Now folks, you don't have to have a super heavy heat for this. Red heat is plenty. One thing you want to do though is break the edges evenly. If you don't, you're going to cause that bar to want to bend a little bit uh, and you don't want to have to fight that. Beat that up. Now, you can clearly see there's a bit of swell right there because of that work, and that's okay. We're going to work that all the way down. And I'm trying to see if I can't get a little bit of reflection on there so that you can see the difference. It's subtle, but it's important. We've got our next heat. I'm going to walk this all the way down. It doesn't take too terribly long. Now, if you have a problem with this thing jumping around and going all squirrely on you, there's a couple of ways that you can mitigate that. And one of those is by using the table over here. If I put this in here, check that out. Doesn't go anywhere. Now, the other side's a little bit more of a problem because you're gonna have to switch sides. Still not a terrible problem. But that way, if you're working that edge and it's wanting to slide and bounce, that'll stop it very easily. So what I'll do now is simply I'll flip this bad boy around and start working this. Oh, look, my heat's not really where it needs to be. I can probably get by if I just let it right there. Or I can be a smart cookie and just go put the damn thing back in the fire. Ah, there we go. You guys see the difference in the control that you're able to exert when you have something to hammer it against? You're not having to chase it all over the top of the anvil. It may seem like a trivial thing, but you'll find that when you're doing this work in mass, those trivial things really add up. Saves a lot of manpower, a lot of muscle. All right, just a little bit of work and I uh, think we're good to go. Got a little bit of a bend right here, so I'm just gonna clean that up. And now what we're gonna need to do is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna mark one inch from the end and we are going to uh, see about putting a hole in this guy. All right, let's talk. So there's a big question that you're gonna end up having to ask yourself in several situations. Do I need to drill this hole or do I need to punch this hole? And so there's a couple of criteria that you're going to want to think about when you make that decision. So for me, the criteria is very simple. Is this hole going to be seen? Uh, and not just the hole itself. Are you going to see the swellings around the hole? So sounds so terrible, doesn't it? The swellings around the hole. That's a terrible way to lead into a video. At any rate, so on something like this, I would never punch this unless I had to, simply because if I punch it, it's not going to do me really any good. The, because the metal's so thick, you're not going to see that cool looking swell there. So th what I would do, and it's way easier to use a drill press to pop your rivet holes in there, a lot cleaner, a lot easier on the assembly. So in something like this, 
I'm going to actually drill all these holes because it's way freaking easier. Now, in some of the tenon joint work and some of the more architectural pieces, there's going to be a hole that's going to be punched because you're going to see the actual deformation in the metal. This is not one of those cases. So even with the hooks that we're about to make, they don't need to be punched simply because you're not going to see anything around the hole. You're simply going to see the head of the rivet. So in cases like this, almost universally, it's better to drill the holes than to punch. Uh, again, if you don't have a drill press, you don't have a drill, you can certainly punch them through there. Um, but for our purposes right now, we're just going to drill these. All right, everybody, here we go. We have all our holes drilled. Everything is nice and evenly spaced. And now it's time to get on to making our hooks. Now, of course, our hooks are six inches long. They are three quarter inch by three sixteenths thick uh, bar stock. Uh, very simply, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pull these out into a taper and we're going to round the back end and turn it into a turkey tail. Now, the trick that I used on the anvil before is you pull out the first one, measure it, and then match all the other ones to it. That is a, I cannot tell you how handy a trick that is. That is how you keep evenness going through. When you're trying to forge things out and keep them uniform, cutting all of them to the same length starting and then having the measurement to follow from the get-go is really the way to do it. Now, for those of you out there, you're probably not going to have a pair of tongs that are specifically designed to hold this. Uh, you may have some flat jaws. And if you're using flat jaws to do this, oh, bless you, my child, because you're going to have one hell of a time of it. In that case, very much like you saw me earlier, there they are, a pair of locking mechanical pliers. I cannot express to you how useful these are to the beginner because they are adjustable in size. And even if they're not box jaws to keep it from flipping around, it's a way easier to lock these bad boys down because you can't hold it that tight with a pair of tongs for that long. So a good pair of, uh, usually a vice grip or kind of the main brand, but a good pair of locking jaw pliers is going to do you a heap of good. So especially on things like this, I may have a set of tongs that will work for this, but most likely I'll use these in conjunction, especially if I'm in there doing detail work. So do not underestimate the usefulness of these type of pliers. Now, one last thing before we get started, because I want to share with you kind of a technique for the production shop. So if you're a beginner, there's a good chance that you would actually do one of these each at a time individually. And that's not going to be very effective for making these in mass. So this is a chance for me to kind of tell you about how to do these in a proper shop. Uh, now, there's a caveat. I dropped one. Don't worry about that. And I'll get it later. Um, there's a caveat in all this because there's an old saying. I'm sure you've heard it. Too many irons in the fire. And this is where that saying comes from. If you really want to get these done effectively, what you want to do is all three of them need to go into the fire. And then basically you pull out and perform the same action three times in a row, basically repeating the first heat on each one. So I'm going to put all three of these in there, initially start working the taper and do the same thing in, a, in triplicate. The danger is, if you're not paying attention, you're not careful with your heat and your air blast, you're going to melt them because you're not watching all of them, thus the saying, too many irons in the fire. However, if you want to make a little bit of money and you want to be good at this and you want to do it in volume, you've got to run that risk. So all three are going in and we're going to start work. Here I'm starting with the first one. And again, as I'm starting my taper, I'm just doing that front end first. There we go. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to get the next one that's hot already in the furnace, or forge rather, and do it the same way. Miss that one. Slippance. There's the next one. And let's do number three.
ba bam there is three really quick so guys i don't think i really have to express anything else on how efficient it is to work these pieces in a gang so i'm going to finish out one just so you guys can see the whole process and not do it in triplicate but you really can appreciate how much more work you can do if you're ganging your pieces in the fire so this is how the blacksmiths in the old days did it and this is how they did it to be profitable so try it out sometimes here we go now you see i've already got that front piece basically made the taper is already there look how easy it is to bring the rest of this piece in line to make a long taper you wouldn't have thought it would have been that easy but again if you prep that tip then you can kind of take your time and it's very easy to get along the taper as you want because you've already done the work in the front the vast majority of the work of any taper is going to be right on that leading edge and voila there is our taper now I'll take my soapstone and again I'll put this on the back side of the edge and I'll mark how long it is so I can use this as a guide uh, for the rest of my pieces Now for the next part, we're going to take that square end on the back side of that taper and we're going to do something that we always refer to as turkey tailing. Uh, on those square edges, you can save yourself a lot of time if you have a grinder, if you'll just knock that sharp square corner off. You can do it with the hammer on the anvil, but it takes a lot more time. It's kind of a pain in the butt. I'm going to do it the hard way so you can see it. But basically what we're going to do, we're going to round off that corner make that end kind of round and then we're going to start flattening it and spreading and beveling that edge because that's what's going to take the rivet and that's kind of going to be a main focal point for an eyeball so if you've got that thing nice and hammered with that turkey tail on there it will play into the taper that you've made on the hook and look really good all right we're going to come in we're going to go ahead and bump these square corners off now they're going to swell a good bit so it, you'll have to kind of go back and forth a couple of times to get them to really kind of shape up but you want to get about right there and now I am going to actually bevel these edges putting more blows toward the top than I am the bottom and what's going to happen is kind of going to make its own taper that's going to come into line with the rest of the taper that we've made so that piece looks like that We'll do another one here and I'll zoom in on the camera a little bit so you can get a better look. Here we go with our next one. And again, I am knocking those corners off. They're gonna bulge and distort pretty bad. So again, it's kind of a pain in the butt to work them in. 
you can save yourself all this problem if you'll just grind it. And now, notice how my hammer is striking. Notice how tilted my hammer is to make that bevel. I'm not coming down just straight on it. I'm making an edge bevel. Now, if you'll notice, look how it kind of follows that taper. You can clean that up a little bit if you want to, but swelling that in kind of completes the taper all the way down, and that looks pretty darn good. Just for fun, I'm going to let you see the third one. Normally, I'd edit most of this out, but hey, I ain't got nothing but time. little bit more and I think I'm good with that I think she's looking right proper so I've got us three uh, blanks for our hooks and while they are still flat this is when I'd recommend you actually go ahead and drill the holes uh, right there in the center of that turkey tail uh, put a good center punch on there and drill them a quarter inch now when doing this type of work uh, don't skimp out on your rivet uh, if you've got a beefy rivet like quarter inch for this, it's going to look really good. If you try to like use a nail on something this small, it's kind of going to look anemic. It's going to look terrible. So try to go with a quarter inch rivet on this. And if you don't have a quarter inch rivet, quarter inch rod is super cheap from the welding supply store. And that's what I make all my rivets out of. It's going to look good, give you plenty of meat to work with. So you'll be good to go. So let me go drill these bad boys and then we'll get to actually making our hook and making our elbow bend. Now that we've got our pieces drilled, now we decide what kind of hook we're going to have. So you can just curl this up like a regular J hook and hang your piece off of there. The problem I find with that is that this, what happens then is it hangs so close to the wall. If you has got a broom or shovel on it, it ends up clinging and it's not any good. Normally what I like to do is I like to put an elbow on this piece so that it sticks out about two, three inches and it gives it some room, some clearance room to hang. So what I'll do is I'll take a heat on this front one and I'm going to make a very shallow little curve, like almost like a spoon, and I'll pigtail the end just so nobody gets stabbed. Once we've done that, we'll measure from the end of that back, put a mark, and we'll make a 90 degree bend to make our hook. All right, I'm going to put a bend over the sharp edge of the anvil about two inches in, and then using the very tip of the anvil, I'm going to make this hook. Check that out. Now, one thing I am going to do is I'm going to make it deep enough that that little top's going to set high because when I come back with my pliers and roll that over, it'll bring it back even. Take my pliers, and that end's pretty thick, so I'm really having to get in there. And it's thick enough, it's not going to stab anybody, so I just may turn this over just a wee bit more. Now, one of the aggravations about dealing with an anvil horn especially when you're trying to do consistent hooks is the fact that it's not completely round it's very difficult to get a really nice round shape with something like this uh, that's why a mandrel is so much handier with something like that all right i'm uh, again going to take about two inches bend that over a sharp edge and then bring that down over the horn Try to keep this bad boy lined up a little bit. And then we'll turn it down. Now real quick, I want to show you something. Uh, if you'll notice that nice texture right there, but if you're looking at this, you, uh, you're probably going to end up noticing that there might be a problem because all that texture's on that side, and if we're going to turn this up, it looks like our damn hook is backwards, and you would be exactly right. Understand that unless you're paying very close attention, uh, it is easy to get these things backwards. But if you do this, and you will, it's easily corrected. If you'll flip this bad boy over, 
and texture that side. It probably won't look as good as your front side, but it'll pass. This is how you cheat just a little bit. Voila, problem solved. All right, I'll turn this guy down. And then, of course, you see it sits a little bit low. So I'm going to readjust so it sits even. And that's good enough for government work. One more again, one more little twist, and we should be in business. Ooh, just a wee bit of adjustment on this one. Make sure she's nice and straight. Man, that looks pretty darn good. So now we've got three of these bad boys, and they are ready to go. So what I'll do now is I'll measure three inches back from the tip of this piece, and then I'll make a mark, and then we're going to use the vise to put an elbow in that. Uh, that way, we've got an offset, so the broom's got a little room to hang, the shovel's got a little room to hang, uh, and everything should be nice and copacetic. So uh, let me make a mark on the anvil so I can make a quick mark, and then we'll go to the vise and bend these up. All right, I chalk marked it. And let's see, actually that works out really well right there. I'm gonna bend this 90 degrees. Now we'll come back and clean it up. Make sure it's straight, that's the other thing. But, that seemed to have been relatively quick and painless. And there we have our nice little hook. How about that crap, huh? Come on, got to give it up for that. Here comes hook number two. Keep it straight up and down there. Oh man, this is going like clockwork. This is way better than I had planned. Man, we are three for three. Check all that mess out. We're good to go. All right. So let's look at that bad boy right there. Look what a nice domed faceted rivet there is. Now, if you've done rivets before, what's different between this one and yours? That's right. The edges aren't broken to pieces and split and look like dookie. Now, how in the world did I get it to do that? Now this is where it comes into what is the objective best way to do a rivet and then when you're going to have to make do. The best way to do a rivet in the modern shop is to use an oxyacetylene torch. Uh, if you have access to nails that are a quarter of inch in diameter or whatever diameter that you need, go to your hardware store, buy that. That is going to be the best best solution. Using the oxyacetylene torch, you can put heat where you need it, spread the rivet, and then when it gets cold, heat it up again. Most of the time, if you try to do a rivet cold, it's going to crack, it's going to fray, it's got to be hot. So, if you're a beginner and you don't have access to oxyacetylene torch and things of that nature, that's where you're kind of going to run into a bit of a problem. The other difficulty in all of this is getting the rivet to stick into place long enough for you to rivet it. There is nothing worse than having a loose rivet because your pieces are not going to stay together and it's usually going to end up, you're going to have a gap in between the two pieces you're trying to rivet and it's going to be a mess. I don't think I've ever been more frustrated than when I've had a sucky rivet set up. So, now, if you're at home, you don't have a lot of equipment, I'm going to show you how to use just a plain piece of quarter-inch material, not a rivet, not a nail, just a 
plain piece of quarter inch rod to get a rivet just like that because the rivet that I just showed you wasn't it didn't even have a head on one side it was just a plain piece of rod that I was able to set and make into something that looked really really good so let me show you what we're going to do now in order for this to work, I may have said this before, but in order for this to work, you need to have your holes drilled or you need to be really good at punching because the rivet needs to fit snugly in there. If the rivet doesn't fit snugly and it rattles around, you're going to have a bad time. So this is where you really need to make sure that you're drilling your holes as opposed to punching them. Uh, you can, it can be done, it's just a lot tougher. So what I have done is I have clipped a three quarter inch piece of quarter inch rod and I'm going to put this into place and I'm going to hammer it through and I'm going to try to make certain that uh, I have just a little bit of material on both sides. In general, at a minimum when you're making a rivet, if your material, your rivet material is quarter inch wide, you want one quarter inch of material sticking above the surface of your material. So I need a quarter inch on both sides. Here is my hook. I'm going to pop this piece in there. And again, because it's quarter inch, it's got a little rust on it, which is a good thing. I'm going to hammer this thing in. And if you'll notice, it moves, but it's still in there pretty well. That's exactly what I am looking for. I'm going to come to our base plate now. Now, again, notice that this thing's already good and tight, and that's exactly what you want. This is going to let you be able to do a proper rivet. Look on that back side. I'm going to make sure that we're close to even as possible. Now, I'm going to set this on the flat of the anvil, and I'm going to very lightly... tap it and swell it so I'm locking that piece in so now I can put this in the fire you don't have to bring this up to yellow heat it can be a red heat and now I'm going to work that rivet over here's my piece again notice it's not at a super high heat but I have enough heat in here to be able to very easily peen that rivet make it look really good but it's not splitting and it's not cracking because I've got enough heat there. When I go to the back, usually on the back side I just flatten, clean it up there and check that out. It's a good solid rivet, no cracks, no checks, looks awesome. Let's do one more. One more time, I'm going to set this into place. Here we go with number three. Again, making sure we're as even as can be right there. I think you guys can see that. Now I'm going to set it, swell it. It doesn't take much. We're good to go there. Now we'll heat, heat and beat. Another good heat. And again, notice I did not have this all the way up to orange. Dull red will do. And there you go with another neat rivet. So guys, let's take a look at the end result. And uh, there you go. Now again, this isn't super fancy, but I find it to be very useful. Again, notice that little bit of a standoff right there. You can straighten those hooks up. It's rough, it's rustic. And now again, you can see in the glare of those lights, look at the texture that's being shown off. Look how good that looks. It looks like the entire thing has been worked. If that was just a completely flat surface with none of that edge breaking, it's not gonna look half as good. It's gonna, this is really the mark of good worked metal and that's what you want. So if I take this guy now, you can see that my hooks very easily fit. Now I've got plenty of space between there 
so they can swing a little bit. They've got room to breathe. And even your shovel, if you notice the shovel's got a wide section here, no matter how you hang it up, it's got enough clearance to be away from the wall. Let's just go for the whole freaking set here. What am I doing? Blah, blah, blah. Check it out. Chingy, 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 chingy. So, guys, there you go. Again, the, the big tripod stands are cool. There's no doubt about it. You can get super artistic. But for just outright utility and being able to get something done that's good, durable, and useful, kind of hard to beat the wall mount. But there you go. So, folks, as we say in the shop, blah blam. Looks good, useful, effective, and not that tough, and not beyond the ability of a beginner. So, you're in good company. Well, guys, this completes the first five part series with the new equipment and in the new year of 2021. Uh, again, uh, for all of you that have been watching the live springs, thank you so much. It is, uh, it's been really freaking awesome. It's good to be back in the shop, and I'm glad to be producing good quality content again. So, guys, as always, please like, comment, and subscribe. It makes a difference on the back end, and we appreciate you. Uh, if you happen to go by TrentonTie.com and want to pick up our most recent book, Trenton's Guide to Love, Riches, and Blacksmithing, it is on sale. So, guys, thank you so much. Appreciate you, and I'll see you again real soon.